One interesting aspect of what's happening now is the increased use of artificial, artificial intelligence, both in the scientific study, but also in platforms like Facebook, Google, Google Maps, and so on. So people often do not realize that the news feed that they're seeing is basically an AI, artificial intelligence, that is just working hard to keep them engaged as much as possible, right? So wait, in a way, by, by interacting with Facebook, they're interacting with artificial intelligence, uh, which is an interesting thought because very often people would ask me, hey, so when am I going to start interacting with robots, right? I'm like, you're interacting with robots for quite some time already. You just don't realize that, right? That what you see on Facebook is basically a product of an artificial intelligence trying to make you happy and make you engaged. And now this has far-reaching consequences. Uh, let me give you an example. Many people say, hey, you know, like, tools are never bad or good. They're morally neutral. Take a knife. Knife is not bad or good. It's just humans that can use knife for bad or good purposes. Now, interestingly, people were saying the same thing about artificial intelligence. They would say, hey, artificial intelligence cannot be evil. It's just that a human user of artificial intelligence can be evil and can leash out artificial intelligence to do evil things. But it's not true. Artificial intelligence can, in fact, be evil regardless of the intentions of, the, of its administrators. Let me give you an example. When you set up an artificial intelligence system, you give it a goal, right? So if I'm Facebook, I will set my artificial intelligence system to keep users engaged and, well, maximize more, uh, my advertising revenues as well, right? So I set up this very complicated AI system that basically optimizes your experience as a user suggest friends to you, suggest content to you or, or on your newsfeed, you know, shows your relevant adverts and so on. And the goal of this AI system is to keep you engaged. Now, the very reason that we use artificial intelligence is that because the tasks that the artificial intelligence is dealing with are too complicated for humans to deal with on our own, right? So you could imagine hiring millions of editors, they would sit down and try to optimize, you know, your Facebook experience for you, right? Pick, you know, just, just the stories for you. But obviously this is just uh, not doable. So what we're having here, we replaced potential human editors with AI that has a goal of keeping you engaged. Now the problem is that the goal might be morally neutral or positive, like keeping you engaged uh, with Facebook, but the ways of achieving this goal, AI develops on its own. So no one really tells exactly AI how to keep you engaged. And AI will come up with ways of its own. Now the problem is that those ways might be uh, ethically questionable. Fake news, for instance. We had this epidemics on, of fake news on Facebook, why? because AI recognized that if it shows you this content, then you will basically be engaged in it. You'll be like, oh my God, this, is, this story is crazy, and people would comment, and some people would say that's true, some other people would say, oh, that's rubbish. So basically what happened that AI boosted user engagement, it realized in an excellent way the goals that its designers you know, asked it to achieve but achieved it in ways that, you know, humans would probably see as potentially uh, unethical. So the ideas behind the algorithm, like when you hear machine learning or neural networks or deep learning networks, ideas behind those models, those artificial intelligence models are really simple. You could explain them to a seven-year-old uh, really easily. But what happens is that those very simple rules that are used to create those models, which are basically just, very often this is just multiplication and addition that are being used to build those predictive models. But then when you add up millions of elements in your equation, 
it, or even hundreds of elements, honestly, in your equation, it's very easy for a computer to work with. It's completely impossible for a human being to comprehend, which creates an interesting situation in which you have individuals and societies making decisions based on what AI told them to do without having an understanding why this decision has been made. Google Maps, you drive to work in the morning, Google Maps tells you how to go there. You kind of don't really question the machine anymore. You know that it's way better than your friends, neighbors, and partners in telling you how to beat the traffic. Now, how this algorithm works exactly? You know, we know what are the rules driving this algorithm, but how exactly the decision for you has been made? This might be already beyond human comprehension. How the stories were chosen for you for your Facebook uh, newsfeed? We know the simple rules that we ask the machine to follow, but exact intricacies of this machine learning model uh, that is actually driving the content or driving the choices of the content to appear in newsfeed beyond our comprehension. Uh, we have now computers analyzing x-rays in order to detect cancer and suggest the best treatment. And we know that those computers are more accurate than doctors in making those decisions. And we have very limited understanding why exactly this particular decision has been made. Well, you can ask the model, the model will be like, hey, this is really simple. Here is one million numbers that drove me to make this decision. Can a human being comprehend you know, one million or even you know, 100 numbers simultaneously? Uh, our brains did not evolve to, uh, uh, to work in this way. Courts makes the decisions, make the decisions about whether to let people go and how long the sentence should be and whether to grant you a parole based on the outcome of an algorithm. So obviously it's a judge that you know, slams the hammer down the whatever podium, but at the end of the day, there's a little screen here and the screen says, the algorithm calculated that this person should get seven years in prison, or you should not grant parole to this person because their chances of reoffending are 70 or 80%. And this number is a product of hundreds of variables that go into it. So no human being can understand. There's a mathematical equation, so it's, it's a deterministic, uh, uh, process. We know that it works because you can apply it to previous cases and in fact it works for the benefit of humans because what it happens is that when the, when the judges, when judges sees you for a few minutes and you know has few seconds to kind of skim through your case and you are un unlikely to be black, uh, then you basically just go to prison because like that's just safest option. Like, oh, just another 100 people in prison, who cares, right? This is the safest option. But now what happens is there is this algorithm there that says, in fact, you know, your intuition is to put them in prison, but they're unlikely to reoffend. so why don't you let them go? So we have evidence that those algorithms, in, in fact, are making prisons more empty because, you know, they let judges be more liberal with their choices. But on the other hand, we have the length of your sentence being decided not by a human being anymore, but by a computer. The time of an algorithm is way cheaper than the time of a judge. So what will happen now is that actually prosecution, or, or they, they will, so counties buy this software. There are a few companies in the US that produce this software. And it's basically big data software. They analyze life histories and cases, case materials, and you know, some demographic variables like you know, number of siblings, number of children, how many convictions you had in the past and whatnot. And then they check, okay, so how likely this person was to reoffend. And you build this huge statistical model and it basically says, okay, a person that has three siblings and did not have this offense in the past or whatnot, you know, is unlikely to reoffend, so why don't you let them go? And the, and the, the prosecutor will actually give it to the judge it's kind of printed out of this cert well, certified, well, accepted in a given jurisdiction computer program, and the judge will be like, you know, okay. Now there's an interesting psychological phenomena here because if the judge disagrees with the program, there's only one way in which judge can disagree with the program, namely the judge could decide to give you a longer sentence. Because now imagine no human being would risk saying, oh, software says this person is likely to reoffend, I will let them go. Why? Because then the judge takes a responsibility 
for shortening the sentence against the advice of the computer overloads, uh, which basically means that you, know, you don't have judges disagreeing with the algorithm because why would they take this responsibility? If the person reoffends, they can always say, look, according to the model, it was unlikely to happen. I just follow the advice of the model. But if the model says this person is going to reoffend and judge lets you go, and then someone comes after you and says, hey, why did you let this guy go? You, what did you say? You acted against the, what the algorithm said. So literally, we have uh, cases of freedom and, uh, and imprisonment decided now by a mathematical formula that no one understands because people don't understand how those formulas work. It's highly disappointing but the fact is that humans are just no better judges of each other than algorithms are. And if anything, algorithms are better judges of us than humans are. Because algorithms are not sexist, are not racist, are not ageist, and are basically not biased against you. And we have so much evidence if you have a black defendant and a white defendant, exactly the same history, black just basically will always get a larger sentence. Now for a computer, it will not happen because computer doesn't care about the color of your skin. So you could argue that basically employing algorithms in such cases, and we have a lot of evidence, actually lowers the sentence length and lowers the reoffending re rates. So it's great for the society and great for the defendants. The problem that I have with it, and I don't know how to solve it, is that we follow those decisions and we have no idea how those decisions have been made.